Mountain rangers and deep gorges once isolated the city and port of Gisborne from the rest of the North Island. And here in the Wyawaka Gorge, the main route in from Auckland, roading has cost up to two pounds an inch. And it's only in the last couple of years that motorists have had an all-weather highway in from the west. New roads to the south and better rail and air services are breaking down the isolation of Gisborne City and the farmland which supports it. We went to Gisborne to find out what plans and hopes people in the area have for the future. Around the city lies the 14,000 acre Gisborne Plain. 60% of New Zealand's maize crop is grown here, along with a great variety of fruit and vegetables, stud sheep, cattle. The city depends on the land, and the main street is lined with offices and stores of stock and station agents. Gisborne can be fairly described as a large market town. And this part of the country was settled by Englishmen in the 1850s, but its connections with England go back to 1769. Somewhere along this beach, just a few minutes walk from what's now the centre of the town, the explorer James Cook made his first landing in New Zealand. Cook found the native Maoris weren't hospitable and named the place Poverty Bay. The name is still retained, but only for sentimental reasons. Today, Gisborne has a population of 23,000, and it's estimated that this figure will double in 30 years. There's a good deal of building going on, and gracious homes put up 40 years ago are finding they have new neighbours, the more functional homes of the 1960s. The city's high birth rate could bring unemployment problems in years to come. There aren't many secondary industries in Gisborne, and most people have jobs directly concerned with farming. There's plenty of seasonal work, but as yet there's not too much offering in the way of full-time jobs in industry. One of the biggest employers is this food processing factory. Mr. Watty, you would be one of the largest employers of labour in Gisborne and the East Coast. Yes, that is uh, correct. We employ around 750 people through our seasonal period, through, that is through the summer months, and during the winter months we employ in the vicinity of 250 people. Well now, what does it mean for the community in town shillings and pence, the sums paid out for workers and for the produce that you process? Well, uh, in the course of 12 months, we pay out uh, just over half a million pounds by way of wages and uh, uh, payments to growers for the various crops which they pass into the factories for freighting. What are your plans for the future? Uh, our future plans are to carry on the development of the products which we have already uh, established in Gisborne, and of the crops we've already established, and also to take some part in the growing fishing industry in Gisborne through the processing and canning of fish. Every morning, trawlers return to Gisborne Harbour. Some go out for just one night, but others make trips lasting up to four or five days. Between them, the five Gisborne fisheries catch 6% of New Zealand's fish. And fish from Gisborne supplies most of the towns in the centre of the North Island. There's a great demand from Australia for frozen fish fillets. And this firm sends more than half its terakihi across the Tasman.
Each year, more and more fish is frozen and shipped out of the port. This is a primary industry which is flourishing. But on the land, sheep and cattle farming aren't expanding. The hill country surrounding the Gisborne Plain needs bigger development. The plain itself supports first-class stud farms and the Hereford cattle bred here are sold all over New Zealand. Cattle, sheep, fish, fruit, vegetables and the maize crop. These are the goods that bring money into the city of Gisborne. But though it's still a market town, the city is growing too fast to remain entirely dependent on farming money. We discussed Gisborne's future with the mayor. We've been trying for years to develop more secondary industries in, in the country. Primary industries, of course, are very largely seasonal. And our efforts are all directed at obtaining a wider diversification of activity so that we can employ the people all the year round. There has been a gradual transition towards secondary industry. But unfortunately, there is not yet a sufficiently wide recognition of the advantages we offer. Probably the first requirement of industry today in a country where there is over full employment is to obtain adequate labor. And in this district, we are perhaps fortunate that we have an unusually large labor potential that could be tapped if there were the demand for it. Now, new roads and better air services have, of course, broken down the traditional isolation of Gisborne. Do you think that this isolation in the past has colored the thinking of the people here? Not so much here, perhaps, as outside. The isolation of Gisborne has probably been exaggerated, particularly in recent years. With the air services today, we're within two hours' flight of Auckland or Wellington, and we can get to any part of the Dominion within a matter of three or four hours, so that isolation is not what it was. Well, finally, Mr. Barker, could you give us your views on the future development of the city and the surrounding area? The future, as I see it, is that there will be steady development. The primary industries, of course, will always be the basic ones in this district, but there will be a steady growth of industry, a steady increase in population, and I'm convinced from my own knowledge of the district that it has a future that's probably unrivaled by any other part of the Dominion. For 20 years, the Gisborne Herald has been reporting and commenting on Gisborne's affairs. Like all good newspapers, it's gone to battle for the district it serves, and at one time or another has fought for better transport services into Gisborne and more land development. Here's the Herald's editor, Geoffrey Muir. Do you have any organization here that uh, is looking after the development of the East Coast? Yes, we have two organizations, one a research organization, its task is to gather information uh, about the economy of the district to foster its development. And then we have Greater Gisborne, the public relations organization. And what have these organizations achieved, Geoffrey? Well, the main purpose uh, that they've achieved is um, better utilization of land. Uh, there's an unlimited extent to which land can be, land use can be improved. The one, uh, aspect is the development of our whole country and secondly the development of the Gisborne Plain, the flat plain uh, on the outskirts of Gisborne. As a newspaper man of course Geoffrey you do have the opportunity of expressing yourself on what should be done for Gisborne's future. Yes. Do you think that the man and the woman in the street are conscious of what they can do? I, I do to, to some extent Solon but I, I think that uh, there's a great deal more they can do and will do. The, uh, in the past three or four years, a great deal of publicity has been given to development, and the public is becoming more and more conscious of it. I think the response is uh, developing and uh, will gain in momentum. Well, let's find out, shall we? What do you like about Gisborne? Well, everything. It seems to have everything. And are you doing anything to further the interests of Gisborne yourself, or do you? Do you care about Gisborne at all? Oh, yes, I do care about it. I, I haven't done very much. I don't have that much time. But. Oh, I like the climate. There's plenty of beaches and uh, 
got a car, there's always plenty of places to go, and the scenery's marvellous. Uh, do you hope to spend the rest of your life in Gisborne? No, I'd like to. It's a good place. Why is it a good place for a boy of 15? Oh, plenty of life. Do you think enough is being done for the youth of Gisborne? Um, no, not really, because some days or some nights, you know, there isn't much on, only pictures, and then some pictures you sort of don't um, appeal to you, you know, and don't we just got to sit around home. And you'd rather have something organised for you? Yes, I think so. Would you like to see a gay life, gayer life in Gisborne? Uh, no, I wouldn't, because as soon as it came here to Gisborne, I'd shift to somewhere smaller. Yeah. Have you any desire to go to work in Auckland or in Wellington? Oh, well, seeing that marriage here and got a family, got a home, you sort of, you can't get away from it. You've got the, your own home and and they'd like to move to Auckland because there's more, uh, be a bigger scope there, wouldn't it? Well, uh, would there be bigger scope for you in your job as a slaughterman? Oh, yeah. oh, yes, there'd be a bit of variety there, like, you know. Better money, do you think? Yes, and, uh, oh, there'd be plenty of work, but I, I'm just as happy here because there's no rush and rush like the city. I used to live in Wellington when I was single. But uh, there's uh, a lot of rush. You're all rushing to catch a train or a tram and you're flat out to get to work. And but here, you? it's just, you just sort of take your time and get there. I was at a meeting, I think, only yesterday when somebody referred to the being out of the stream of traffic. My immediate reply was, well, who wants to be in the stream of traffic anyhow? And I think that possibly Gisborne has a good many advantages in that we have ready communication with outside but we have managed to avoid the rat race that's so common perhaps in some of the larger centres.